Good afternoon. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank um, the many people in the background who've done so much work to make this such a wonderful day and a half. Um, and I have an impossible task. It's to um, talk about both terrorism and education in 15 minutes. And academics, as you probably know, are trained to speak in 50-minute increments, so it'll be a challenge. Um, but first, terrorism. Um, we heard this about populism yesterday. This tends to be a term that is attributed to anything one doesn't like. The only universally accepted attribute of the term terrorism is that it's something the bad guys do. So when I talk about terrorism, I'm talking about the deliberate targeting of non-combatants for a political purpose by a sub-state group. So just to try to be clear again, what, what it is that we're talking about when we talk about terrorism, the first crucial characteristic of terrorism is that it's a political act. If it's not politically inspired, then we shouldn't use the label terrorism. It doesn't make it better or worse. Um, but you see, as soon as there's an atrocity, immediately the press would like to label it terrorism. We saw this in the Boston Marathon uh, bombing. Uh, President Obama studiously attempted not to use the language of terrorism until it was established who had done this and why. But he, he couldn't. After about 24 hours, he too had to label it terrorism. Second point is that if it doesn't involve violence or the threat of violence, we shouldn't use the language of terrorism. And that suggests that terms like cyber terrorism are not actually that helpful. The British lexicon is broad enough to include language to explain the uh, sabotage of our IT facilities without necessarily resorting to the language of terrorism. Third point is terrorism is symbolic. Um, terrorists are invariably outmanned and outgunned by their opponents, so they use symbolic targets to enhance the psychological impact of the act. So the World Trade Center, Parliament, you name it. So, the randomness, if nobody is chosen, nobody is safe. So the more random the attack, the more fear is spread. The fourth point um, is that terrorism is not violence for the sake of it. And it isn't violence in the expectation of defeating the enemy. It's violence to communicate a political message. And this, of course, is where social media comes in. Uh, social media is used to spread propaganda, to win recruits, and to, to educate um, on their nefarious uh, tactics. Um, now, this, the kind of debates we have about the role of media, social media, in um, spreading the word of terrorism are very similar to the kinds of discussions that been, have been had over the past decades about the role of media and, and terrorism. The fifth point is that the audience of the terrorist and the victim of the terrorist are not the same. So terrorists use uh, victims to communicate a message to, to another audience. So for example, if somebody came in here and shot me because um, his son didn't get into Oxford this year, it, it wouldn't matter how terrified you all were by gun-toting Englishmen. It wouldn't be a terrorist act because the point was to get me. On the other hand, if somebody threw a grenade in here and blew us all up, because they felt we represented a, a decadent secular society that they'd like to see replaced with a religious one, or because we represented a corrupt plutocracy that they'd like to see replaced with a classless society. Whether they blew all of us up, or all the people having lunch in the Bank of England, or in the Ritz, or whatever, it wouldn't matter. The particular victims are interchangeable, and that's quite unusual for those who use violence. And the final distinguishing characteristic of terrorism is the deliberate targeting of non-combatants. So terrorists have elevated the excesses of warfare to deliberate strategy. Um, and this separates terrorists from the most proximate forms of violence, even political violence, like guerrilla warfare and so on. So terrorism then, it's a tactic. It's a tactic used by many different groups in many parts of the world in pursuit of many different objectives. So in my view, it makes no more sense to declare war on the tactic of terrorism than it does on any other tactic, be it precision-guided bombing or what have you. And much less does it make any sense to declare war on the emotion of terror. So it is then the means that are used and not the ends that are pursued that determines whether or not a group is a terrorist group. And unless and until we're willing to label a group, 
whose goals we consider legitimate, a terrorist group, if they deliberately target non-combatants to achieve those ends, we're never going to be able to afford effective uh, international collaboration against terrorism. Now, this tactic will continue to be used as long as it's effective. And one of the great advantages of terrorism, uh, from the perpetrator's point of view, of course, are the low barriers to entry. Uh, terrorism is very cheap. It's a very low-tech tactic. The most expensive terrorist attack in the history of the world was the World Trade Center bombing on 9-11, which cost an estimated $500,000. Now, in response to that, the American government has spent over a trillion enhancing domestic security and many more trillions in the subsequent wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, precipitated by the 9-11 attacks. Um, but the 9-11 attack, of course, is far and away the most expensive terrorist attack. Most are very cheap. We saw a couple of weeks ago in London, uh, Khalid Massoud, all he needed was a knife and a rented car to throw London into chaos. So for a room full of, of tech gurus, what do you do when you're faced with a very low-tech opponent? Now, there are things that, that technology can do. Uh, certainly, sophisticated attacks along the lines of 9-11 are much less likely, precisely because of, of the capacity of organizations to identify patterns and disrupt complex um, interactions. There's also biometric data and individual tracking, so we can track bad guys. We can identify explosives and see where they came from, which we couldn't do before. We, through surveillance in cyberspace, which of course raises all kinds of privacy issues, but we can detect uh, radicalization when it's taking place. Um, and one thing we can do, and we've been way too slow about doing, is we can uh, create counter-narratives to uh, counter the recruitment that takes place on the internet. And I think we have been extraordinarily slow in taking advantage of the fact that we have a much more compelling and attractive narrative, and we have infinitely greater technological skill um, to, to counter the narratives that are being sown on the internet. Um, but if we want to counter terrorism, we need to understand what it is the terrorists are, are trying to achieve. And I think it makes sense to look at two levels of goals of terrorist groups. The first differ with the type of terrorist group. So if you're ISIS, you want to establish a caliphate. If you're the IRA or the PLO or the ETA, you want independence or secession, so on. If you're the Red Brigades, the Bader Meinhof, you want to overthrow capitalism. So it has to be said that terrorists have been singularly unsuccessful in achieving these kind of fundamental underlying political goals. But the more immediate goals, the secondary goals, if you like, they have have been much more successful. And these, um, at the risk of oversimplification for the sake of alliteration, I, I call the three R's. Revenge, renown, and reaction. So that is what terrorists are trying to achieve. Uh, first and most important is revenge. Um, every terrorist one talks to, every terrorist website one consults, it's suffused with the language of revenge. And this is both uh, documentation for internal consumption and external consumption. So it isn't necessarily revenge for something they personally have suffered, but rather a group with whom they identify have suffered. They actually see themselves as being the defenders to our aggressors. The second point is, is renown or glory. Now, publicity has always been the a goal of terrorists. The 19th century anarchists used to call it propaganda by deed. But Renown implies more than, than just publicity. It also implies kind of glory to redress the humiliation they believe themselves to have suffered at our hands. Now, for the rank and file, this glory can be in terms of increased social status in the community that goes along with strutting around with a gun, or what have you. For the leaders, it's more glory on a global stage. If, if you remember uh, bin Laden's last uh, video, uh, the last of the ones that he made. Um, he had given up the Kalashnikov and the fatigues, and he was sitting in a desk um, trying to present himself as a worthy interlocutor um, of global leaders. He was addressing the people of Europe. Uh, in one of his wackier statements, he expressed outrage at the hypocrisy of the US government in admitting the Irish terrorist, Jerry Adams, 
into the White House. So he clearly felt from his cave in Waziristan or wherever he was at the time that myth that he was entitled to an invitation to the White House. Um, so this desire for glory is, is quite a powerful motive. And the third, third motive is the desire to provoke a reaction. Terrorists operate, uh, they're action-oriented in individuals operating in an action-oriented in-group. It's through action that they communicate with the world. So they care more about the scale of the reaction than the particulars. I mean, we don't even know all these years later whether bin Laden um, planned the 9-11 attack because he wanted to drive the US and the Middle East or, be, or whether he wanted to provoke a war between Islam and the West. My own view is that he probably didn't know or really care. What he cared about most was the scale of the reaction. And in the scale of our reaction, I believe we played directly into his hands. By, when you elevate what were even then um, a fairly motley collection of extremists living under the sponsorship of what was then the poorest government on the planet, you elevate their stature to a degree to which they could have only dreamt. So by declaring war on terror, terror and terrorism, I think we are, we're conceding uh, what it is terrorists are trying to achieve. Now, they can take revenge, but we're the ones who seed the reaction, and we're the ones who seed the renown. Now, let me uh, turn then to uh, education and terrorism quickly. Given that Google is a company founded and run by engineers, I thought it might be interesting to talk just a little about the educational background of terrorists, and in particular, about the overrepresentation of engineers in violent extremist Islamist groups. Now, our, our data isn't very good, but all the data we do have points in the same direction. So in short, where left-wing groups recruit among humanities and social science graduates, right-wing groups and Islamist groups recruit doctors and engineers. Now, we don't know why, and it's not an obvious explanation would be terrorist groups need bomb-making skills that engineers are likely to have, but that wouldn't explain the difference between left and right-wing groups. It's also the case in groups where they recruit their own members, they have fewer engineers than in groups in which people volunteer. Um, one of the explanations, or partial explanation, is the concept of relative deprivation, which is... Um, a term coined by uh, Ted Gurr in, the, in 1970. Um, the essence of re relative deprivation is that it's not your um, objective condition that drives you to rebel, but your condition relative to somebody else, people with whom you identify. So um, I have three children. If I were to go home this evening and the three kids were there and I didn't bring them home any presents, they would look up briefly from what they're doing and continue um, with whatever it was. If I went home this evening, and brought them each one of those nice Google pens that we got when we checked in. They would look up and be, chat to me for five minutes and say, oh, you should talk to those nice Google people, you come back in a good mood. If I went home this evening and gave my two daughters a Google pen and gave my son one of those amazing Google watches we heard about yesterday, um, I would have two furious children. Now, their objective condition would be better if I brought home nothing. It would be the same if every, uh, than if they all got uh, pen, but in this instance, they'd be furious. And that's the essence of relative deprivation. It's, uh, so it's not the poor and the dispossessed that have provided so much of the energy and drive and recruits to a terrorist group, but it's actually the would-be elites. Um, and in particular, when it comes to extreme Islamist groups, it's engineers. Engineers are 14 times more likely um, to join a terrorist group than the male population, four times more likely than the a university educated male population. This is in the Middle East. Now, doctors are also overrepresented in terrorist groups, but doctors, given the choice, will join uh, secular Islamist groups and the less violent Islamist groups. Engineers, given the choice, will always go for the most religious, most extreme, most violent um, terrorist group. Moreover, when they do join, they are the most committed members. Um, humanities graduates are the least committed, and doctors tend to be as committed as one would expect from their numbers in the population. And we measure commitment by the likelihood of defect, defecting from the group. So a humanities graduate is 40 times more likely to defect from a terrorist group than an engineering graduate. 
Um, now, women, it has to be said, are also underrepresented in terrorist groups, and also when they are members, do tend to be the most extreme. So what's very interesting today is the fact that there are such similarities between right-wing groups and Islamist groups, both in their recruitment of engineers, but also in, in their sense of, of tradition, in their sense of nostalgia for a lost past, a sen their deep social conservatism, their profound sense of order, um, their obsession, if you like, with order, hierarchy, and strong identity boundaries. So uh, we don't actually know why this is, and I'd love to engage any of you in any views that you have on why it might be. Many people think it's the kind of education engineers get, but it's clearly not the kind of education and experience Google engineers get. But what then is the role of universities in, in addressing this, this challenge? So as I've argued, a, a university degree is no antidote to political violence, but I actually believe that an education is. As drivers of social mobility and engines of our economy, uh, universities can undermine the emergence of the sense of relative deprivation that emerges with the frustrated ambitions of the highly educated into economies that cannot absorb them. But if universities focus exclusively on training a skilled workforce, we lose the opportunity to provide an education that is so much broader and so much more important. An education that produces a generation accustomed to thinking critically, to acting ethically, and always questioning, whether it's the doctrines of the government of the day or the ideologies of those who wish to overthrow it. An education that teaches empathy with others, that exposes its students to a cosmopolitan community of scholars that celebrates difference rather than fears it, and that, above all, inculcates a sense that truth is an aspiration, not a possession, this is a generation that will reject every effort to impose orthodoxy. So the theme then of, of the last couple of days has been to find optimism, and I am optimistic on the subject of um, terrorism, because, as I say, we have uh, the ability to deny terrorists both the reaction and the renown that they seek. It's in our hands. Um, we have a far more compelling story to tell, and we have the technology to do it. Um, and then to remember that the odds of any one of us being killed in a terrorist attack is infinitesimal compared to the likelihood of our being killed by a drunk driver. It is the likelihood of any one of us being killed as, by a terrorist is equivalent to the likelihood, uh, statistically the equivalent of the likelihood of being hit by lightning, killed by a bee sting, or dying in our bathtubs. So it is imperative as we think about terrorism, and as we watch the news, that we maintain our perspective. Uh, this is not an existential threat. It's a threat we can easily contain. Thank you very much.